So we are taking questions on testing techniques and estimation. So first is, can you explain the boundary value analysis? Boundary value analysis. So, you know, in a black box testing, what we do, that first we try to find out the equivalence partition. And after finding the equivalence partition, we take the values which are at the boundary you know, of the input values. So the boundary values are taken and these boundary values are inputted to the, to the code which you want to test or the module you want to test and then the boundary value analysis is done. So in some projects there are scenarios where we need to do the boundary testing. Uh, just for instance, let's say for a bank application you may withdraw a maximum of say 25k and a minimum of 100. So in boundary value testing we only test the exact boundaries rather than hitting the middle because most of the error occur at the boundaries only. This means we only test above the maximum and below the maximum. So if this is the maximum, this is the minimum, we check just below the maximum and above maximum and this covers all the scenarios. Next question is can you explain equivalence partitioning as I just mentioned the equivalence partitioning. So in equivalence partitioning, first let me tell you what is equivalence, equivalence relation. Equivalence relation is that relation which follow the symmetric, reflexive and transitive property. So selective, reflexive and uh, the symmetric, reflexive and transitive if certain values they follow this property, these properties, then we can place it into the equivalence class. So making equivalence class or partitioning with respect to the values which are equivalence, this is known as equivalence partitioning. So in equivalence partitioning, we identify inputs which are treated by the system in the same way and produce the same result. It means if I take make certain classes, say I make three classes. So if I take this input or this input, it will remain the same. You can check for any of these values or uh, in the second class any value you can take because this is an equivalence class. So the uh, the input which you you are going to take from here is is uh, is going to produce the same results. By applying this equivalence partitioning, we minimize the redundant test cases. We don't need to check all these. We are just going to check the minimum minimum of these redundant test cases we don't want. So we apply the test like this if uh, it forms a equivalence class or not. All the test cases should test the same thing, first of all, all the test cases inside, they should produce the same result, they should produce the same result. If one test case catches a bug, then others should also catch the bug, they also should create the same bug. If one of them does not catch the defect, others should not catch, it should be bug actually. You know? Why? Because defect are the bugs which come after the um, installation or deployment or when it is already submitted to the user. Can you explain the random or monkey testing? You know, you have seen monkey. There is no set pattern of monkey. Monkey can go anywhere. From here, this branch of tree, to that branch of tree. So random testing is also known as the monkey testing. In random testing, data is generated randomly, often using a tool. So random testing has certain weaknesses. Why? Because they are not realistic. You cannot just check, just um, the randomly, you cannot test. So many of the tests are redundant and they are unrealistic and you are going to spend more time analyzing the results only. And you cannot create the test if you do not record the data was used for testing. So once you test it, you may not be able to recreate the problem. This kind of testing is uh, of no use and uh, they are generally performed by the beginners or the newcomers and its best use is to see if the system will hold up any adverse effect. You know, if you give a uh, so a toy, electronic toy to a child, what he is going to do? He is going to do the random testing. He doesn't know what it is doing. He will uh, devise any mean or anything so that he may understand what ex exactly is going on. This can be an example of random testing. Next is what are semi-random test cases. Semi-random test cases. As the name is suggesting, semi-random semi testing is uh, controlling random testing and removing the redundant test cases. So, if you are able to if you are able to manage to control the random test just by removing the redundant test case, then you can say that you are making the test case in a semi-random manner. So what we do is to perform random test cases and equivalence partitioning to those test cases, which in turn will remove the redundancy, thus giving a semi-random test cases. What is a pairwise defect? Can you explain a pairwise defect? Orthogonal array. Orthogonal array. 
One, two, three, start. What is a negative and a positive testing? The negative test is when you put in an invalid input and you are going to receive an error. This is a negative testing. What is a positive testing then? Positive testing, that means you are going to place the valid input and you expect some action to be completed in accordance with this specification. This is a positive testing. Now let us take some questions on testing estimation. What are the different ways of doing black box testing? There are uh, various methods we generally use to do the black box testing. Top down according to the budget, work breakdown structure, gas and gut filling, early project data and test point analysis. Can you explain the TPA, TPA analysis? TPA is a technique which is used to estimate the test efforts for the black box testing. So these inputs for TPA are the counts which are derived from the function points. Function points. So we have the features of TPA. This is used to estimate only the black box testing TPA, the efforts which are going to be um, given to the this black box testing, and it requires function points as an input. So function points, white box testing, test point analysis, which we are calling as TPA, and then we using this uh, function points, we can use or we can find out the black box, black box testing estimate using the function points. So this is test point analysis. Can you explain the uh, elementary process? What is an elementary process? The software applications are a combination of an elementary process. When elementary process they come together, they form a software application. So these are elementary processes. So there are two types of elementary processes. First is your dynamic elementary process. Then you have a static elementary process. What is a dynamic elementary process? The dynamic elementary process moves data from one internal application boundary to an external application boundary and vice versa. So from one internal application boundary to an external application boundary or vice versa from here also. For example, input data screen where, where user inputs data into the application or the data moves from input screen inside the application. Though this is a dynamic elementary process. What about the static elementary process? The static elementary process which maintains the data of the application either inside the application boundary or in the or in the external application boundary. For example, in a customer maintenance screen, maintaining customer data is a static elementary process. How this TPA work? TPA, we have just seen TPA. So this is point analysis. There are three main elements which determine estimate for the black box testing. First is your size, your test strategy, and the productivity. Using all these three elements, size, test strategy, and productivity to find the estimate of the black box testing. These three elements we can determine the estimate for black box testing. So let's take these elements first is the size. The most important aspect of estimating is defining the or definitely the size of the project. So the size of the project is mainly defined by the number of function points. But uh, a function point fails or pays the least attention for the following factors like uh, complexity, interfacing, and uniformity. Complexity means Complexity defines how many conditions exist in the function points identified during the project. So more condition means more test cases, which means more testing estimation. And uh, interfacing means how much, how it does one function affect other part of the system. That is, if a function is modified, then accordingly the other system has have to be tested as one function always impact another. So interfacing. Uniformity means how reusable is the application. It is important to consider how many similar uh, structured function exist in the system. And it is impo important to consider the extent to which the system allows testing with the slight modification. This is the size. So, for example, let us take a customer name. If length is greater than 20, error, otherwise valid. So, this is one test case. But for exactly same thing, we can have two big test cases. Customer name, if length greater than 20, valid, error. Then other is, if invalid character, if no valid, if yes, correct. So we are using two test cases here.
then the trust strategy. So the project has a certain requirement. The importance of all these requirements, they are going to affect the testing estimates. So any requirement importance is from two perspectives. One is the user importance, other is the user in, uh, usage. So depending on these two characteristics, that is the user importance and the user usage, a requirement rating can be generated and a strategy can be chomped out accordingly, which also means that the estimates vary accordingly. What about the productivity? This is an important aspect to be considered. Productivity depends on various aspects. This is a complexity which we are talking about. We can have, you know, complexity depends on the size. It also has interfacing and uniformity with it. So we found the TPA, that is test point analysis. So we have the productivity and test strategy. Test strategy is based on user importance and user usage intensity. And the productivity of course on the environmental factor and productivity. Can you explain an application boundary? The first step in this function point analysis is to define the boundary. So there are two types of major boundaries, internal application boundary and external application boundary. The external application boundary can be identified if, uh, by these tests. Does it have or will it have any other interface to maintain its data which are not added by you? Does your program have to go through a third party API or layer in order for your application to interact with the tax department application your code has to interact with the text department API or not. The best test is to ask yourself if you have full access to the system, if you have full rights to make changes, and it is an internal application boundary, otherwise it is an external boundary. Can you explain the various elements of function points FTR, ILF, EIF, EI, EO, EQ, GSC? Because these are used in the function point analysis. So FTR is file type references. A file is a FTR is a file or data referenced by a transaction. And FTR should be an ILF or ELF, these two. And so count each ILF or ELF reading during the, during the process. If the EP, EP is maintained as an ILF, uh, then count that as a FTR also, that is file type references. So by default, you will always have a FTR in any EP. Internal logic files, ILF, these are logically related data from the user point of view. And they reside in the internal application boundary or they are maintained by uh, or maintained through the elementary process of the application. And ILFs can have maintenance screen, but not always, you know. Then we have uh, external interface files, EIF, they reside in external application boundary. So EIFs are used only for reference purposes and they are not maintained by internal applications. So EIFs are maintained by external applications, then external input. EIs are dynamic elementary processes in which the data is received from the external application boundary. For example, user inter interaction screen, where data comes from the user interaction to the internal application. External output EO, EO are dynamic elementary process, external output. In which the derived data crosses from the internal application body to the external application body. What about external inquiry? The EQ is a dynamic elementary process in which result data is obtained from one or more ILF and EIF we have already seen. So in this EP, uh, some input requests have to uh, enter the application body and output result exists the application body. GSC that is general system characteristic and all the previously discussed they relate only to application but there are other things also to be considered while making software such as you are going to make uh, what is the architecture that is entire application what is the perform performance level you are expecting so these are the GSC general system characteristics can you explain the function points we have seen the function points right now so function points is a unit measure of software much like an hour is to measure in time Miles are to measure in distance and Celsius is to measure in the temperature. So it's a measurement. So it's a unit of measurement of software. So function points are ordinal measure, much like a measure such as kilometer, Fahrenheit, hours, and so on and so forth. So this approach computes the total function points value for the project by totaling the number of external user interface inputs sorry, and EIP inquiries, outputs, and master files, and then applying the these weights. You know, sorry, inputs, outputs, inquiries, and master files. There are certain weights. Each of these function points contributor can, can adjust within a range of C plus minus 35 degree for a specific project complexity. Can you explain the steps in function points? Below are the steps. First, we count the ILF, EIF, EI, EQ, RAT, DAT, FFTR and use the rating table. So, after we have counted all the elements, you will get the unadjusted function points right now. So, you put the rating from 0 to 5 for all the GSC, that is the general system characteristics. Then adding total of all these 14 GSCs, GSC to come up with the value VF. And how you are going to find out sum of all GSC divided by 100 plus 0 0.65, which is VF. Now you make the calculation of adjustment factor 
formalized total function point is nothing but the unadjusted function point which you take from here multiplied with the VF we have found here step, step 2. So VF into total this unadjusted function point will give you total function point. And make estimation how many function points you will do per day. So this is also called the performance factor. So on the basis of performance factor, uh, you can calculate the man and days. So once you have computed the function points, let me tell you again you how you are going to make the estimation. That is how many function points you will be doing per day. And this is the performance factor. So you calculate the man per day. So this is uh, about testing and testing estimation techniques. And specifically, we talked about the uh, function points here. Function point metric. We have not talked about we about the Kokomo here. Function points here. Okay. Thank you so much.